Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Barbara. Barbara is a uh, has written a, a small shelf of, of books uh, that help entrepreneurs, especially small business owners, to start, grow, brand, market, and when they're ready to sell, to sell their business. She's the author and uh, co-author of Small Business Marketing Kit for Dummies, Branding for Dummies, um, Business Plan Kit for Dummies, and the um, guide to selling your business, small business, available for free for download at Biz by Sell. Uh, the site's uh, that's the internet's largest uh, website for business uh, businesses for sale. So most of you guys know that. And uh, was, I think we said you got three million visitors per month. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Her current focus is on helping small business owners uh, capture a final round of value by selling, not closing their business. Uh, from experience, she knows that most small businesses aren't in a sell-ready shape when owners want out. Uh, therefore, most business owners never sell. Today, she's here to talk about what a sell-ready business looks like, how to get your business in sell-ready shape, and what's involved uh, to present the business for sale. Uh, find the right buyer, navigate and negotiate the sales process, and manage a successful owner-to-owner transition. Man, that was a mouthful. Thank you for Ooh. being here. <laughs> I probably I didn't I didn't get it all the way through without you know messing up a little bit, but I think we did a pretty good job of telling everybody kind of job. where you're from. So uh, let's just jump right in. Let's get people to know you. What got you into this? You know, kind of you're an advocate or a, like a, a, an expert, and all the like buying, growing, selling a business. What got you into this space? What got you wanting to help other entrepreneurs? <clears throat> well. I'll start with the fact that my husband and I owned an ad agency and we owned it for 15 years. And uh, then one day we were both tired of it at the same time. Usually one would want out and the other one would say, come on, you know, get, get with the program. And one day we both wanted it for sale. My husband wrote a little four line ad for the wall street journal and <clears throat> we ran it and the business sold. And I'll tell more about that later. Cause it wasn't, you know, it takes a year to sell a business really to transition it. But once we sold it, I realized that the whole time we'd had the business, we'd had to turn down a lot of small businesses that came to us because what an ad agency has to charge would eat up the entire budget before they even do anything of a small business. And I thought, where are they going to go? And back then, bookstores store, were a much bigger deal. And I would hang around the business section and talk to small business owners who were flipping through looking for something that would help them. So I wrote the Four Dummies group and said, you have nothing for small business. You have marketing for dummies. It talks about $100,000 trade show budgets. You have nothing for small business. And remarkably, in those days, they used to give big advances. I got an advance, no agent or anything, and I wrote small business marketing for dummies, which in its third edition became the small business marketing kit for dummies because they started including, at that time, CDs and now downloadable forms. And then they called me what I do branding for dummies, happily. So I co-authored that with Bill Chiavelli, who did the FedEx logo. And I mean, he's really a branding pro. So he knew the real technical aspects and, and I knew the more marketing side. And then I teamed up with the uh, authors of Business Plans Kit for Dummies, because I realized if you don't build a strong business, you're not going to be able to brand or sell a business. And that's how I ended up getting to Biz by Sell. I'm on a mission now. I only do one thing. The books are out there. I'm not doing that anymore. My mission is to have more small business owners not close. And they close. I mean, they get ready to sell and, you know, they don't sell, they close and they liquidate at rock bottom prices. And it breaks my heart because that was their final chance to reap around a value. That's how I got into it. That's awesome. <clears throat> and I totally, totally buy in that there just wasn't a lot of resources even college for marketing small business. I have a master's degree, MBA in marketing. I got out and I, embarrassingly, I spent pretty much every penny I can get on trying to uh, grow a startup and market it myself. I, I had a master's degree in marketing. I could just be able to yeah. to do this. And uh, um, 
I'm a little ashamed to say it, but out loud, but uh, you know, everything I could get my hands on probably 750 to 800,000 of our money. I use trying to grow this thing, market it and learn through a very valuable lesson. That was just engineers, software and everything else. But your, even your standard MBA course doesn't teach you what it takes to take a company from zero dollars to say five or ten million dollars where you can actually have a decent marketing revenue uh, or a budget. And uh, I ended up out of that. I ended up going out and getting retrained by local gurus and mentors and being a coach in this space uh, under J. Conrad Levinston. So I, I'm on board with your story. Like, like there's just not a lot of resource. At least there wasn't. Now there's you know a lot more in the last probably 15, 20 years. You know, since I since I got my master's degree, right? So. But you know, still small businesses start with a dream and no plan, and you don't have to. I tell people you don't have to have a plan in writing. You have to have a plan at least in your head. And one of the things that that plan needs to include is what is your funding runway. And I and it sounds, you know, silly, but my husband and I lived in Honolulu for seven years, and then we moved to Malaysia because we joined the Peace Corps. It was more interesting even than Hawaii. And uh, the Peace Corps puts away a little bit of money for you every month. It's called a real reallocation allowance. And we got home and we had that reallocation allowance. That's about what we had. That was our runway. We knew we had six months that we could live on that. And so we had six months to turn that business into a success. We knew that. We knew, And you know what? We, we did it. But we knew our runway and we knew, therefore, that's all we had. So over those six months, we couldn't spend this, this or that. We had to just go get clients and and we knew, OK, what kind of clients do we need? We need a bank because a bank gives you credibility. So we got this regional bank. I mean, but the point is businesses start with a dream and no plan. And so that was it, I highly recommend business plans kit for dummies because it actually has a temp template in the back uh, that you can follow. And it is your whole business plan template. Um, and then the next thing is to build a reputation and that's branding for dummies because basically businesses sell for what they make plus goodwill and goodwill is in large part your brand. It's your clients. It's what people think of your business and, you talked about a couple of days ago when we were talking, you talked about branding and you know, all a brand is you have one, whether you know it or not, it's what other people say about you when you're not in the room. That's what Jeff Bezos said once. And he's right. Um, it's, it's what people think of you. If they think that you're an also ran, that's your brand. Yep. I got it. And, um, you know, a lot of people, they, they look at like where, where to start. Like if you're, we're, we're talking a little bit here in this starting a business and, and most of our audience is like they buy one that's already existing. But when you're looking at, if even if you buy one that's already existing, a lot of times you're buying something that doesn't have a really good marketing plan or, or even a, I've seen companies at the $1 million mark, even as high as almost $2 million mark in revenue that don't have a strong brand at all. Right. They've got three or four really good customers and that's, that's a little scary in itself. So Yes, it is. Right. So you just said that basically the brand is a story people tell you, you know, about you that when you're not there. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you determine like what a great brand is? If like if one of our customers or customers, our listeners here are out there looking at something, I, we, we, we've been taught on how to do financial due diligence. We've been talking on how to do kind of a little bit of personal due diligence, the culture, the environment. How do you do brand equity due diligence? How do you see the value of a brand? What would be a there's way to determine that? There's two terms. There's brand value and there's brand equity. Mm -hmm. Brand value is how customers value the brand. Brand equity is how investors value the brand. So how you know your brand value is you look at, you can look at pricing, what are people willing to pay you versus what they're willing to pay others? And if they're willing to pay you more, then your brand value is higher. They value you higher than the others. I mean, in the ad industry, it was an hourly rate, basically. And if we could get 125 an hour and, you know, smaller groups were getting 85, we knew that that, what, I'm not doing the math very well, but the difference was our brand value. Then you times that for brand equity, you times that difference between how many hours you sell, and that becomes a sense of your brand equity. The other way you value a brand is you say, what would it cost to recreate 
our presence, our reputation? What would it cost in terms of getting a new name and trademark, getting online presence, getting market dominance, building the clientele we've built? And if that's expensive, you have a better chance of selling your business. If you don't have a good domain name, if you don't have online presence, if you don't, then you're not, your business isn't as saleable. And that's all part of getting your business ready for sale is well in advance. You start looking at those things. And, and in the biz buy sell guide, there are checklists of what you need to do to be ready to sell your business. And, you know, one thing is have profits and sales that are going up for three years, three to five years. And, if they're not, people are going to have questions. Now, the pandemic throws that off a little, but people understand the pandemic. You don't even have to explain that. Well, that was the year of pandemic. Look at how already we're bouncing back, and you can see the sustainability of our business. Most of the audience I know and the people I work with, we want to see the last three years, and because the pandemic's there, if if they had a bad year. some A lot of companies surprisingly did well okay. during that. But uh, if they had a bad year, we want to see the year prior. So we want... It's- Show me, show me your best three years in the last five, but I want to see all of it, right? I, you know, that's right. You know, you know, put your best foot forward. I, want, I, I agree. We, we can evaluate based on the best, um, but especially now, we should, you should at this stage. I think people should be recovering, so you and should see the recovery. You're right about some businesses did better. I mean, Biz Buy Sell is showing that the fourth quarter of last year was like way, way more business sale transactions than previous years. And you know what did best? Service businesses, liquor stores, restaurants. I mean, why are we not surprised at liquor stores? <laughs> but, but anyway. Um, the way the world's going, we should all own a couple of liquor stores. They're going to be pretty profitable <laughs> when there's this know, much turmoil. Most, <laughs> most really small businesses are in those categories, particularly service. And for some reason, service businesses usually are really presented by the owners and they think they can't sell. And so I think that's another reason why small businesses close. They simply think they can't sell, which is maybe an overinflated sense of self. Um, but, but when I tell them they need to get their business ready for sale, I, they say, well, what does that mean? I say, really, in a sentence, Inc. Magazine once had a cover that I've cited a thousand times, and it was, do you want to be the business or run the business? If you are the business, likely you can't sell it. If you run the business, you have a good chance. That means getting the business off your shoulders, getting the finances out of your head, getting the clients as happy to take advice from someone else as from you, Um, sharing decisions. And do you know how you know? Take a three-week vacation. And don't call in constantly. Give people. Know who's responsible. Know what two people can sign checks in your absence. Um, So that, you know, that's what we used to do when we were gone. The CFO could sign, but somebody signed a second one. So that, you know, you know that you're protecting your finances. You have systems and processes, so you don't worry how people are doing things. Um, You have a business you can walk away from. That means it's transferable, which is a key key ingredient in successful business sales. If people think they can't pick up and keep the wheel running, they're not going to pay for it. And you know what? To a lot of small business owners, there's a sense of pride in that. And what you want them to do is say, don't say call Barbara, say call the agency. And they know that who's ever at the agency is well-trained and superior to other places they could call. Um, If they're saying call Ron, then you don't have a a business that's as easy to sell. Not that you can't sell it, but that's my whole point. Get your business ready for sale. Ideally, what I want you to do is start your business knowing you're going to sell it someday. So it's not Ron's podcast. You know, it's the ready to exit. I'm I'm sorry. I I hope how to exit. Um, But that's it. That's a saleable brand. You know, that's why I call the uh, podcast. I don't think I've ever even said this on the podcast. The reason I call it How to Exit, when, I talk, when we, we really talk about buying, growing, running, and selling, is in my mind, everything that you own as a business, you should be considering like in the long term, you're going to exit at some point. 
right? Absolutely. So, you know, how to exit is a conversation about how to acquire something, how to grow it, but always keep in mind that at some point this, this needs to be sellable and you need, you should be running it, managing it and treating it as if it's, you know, it's like, you know, it's for sale. I honestly believe, and I have this for the, the companies I have right now is keeping a deal room. I actually have a marketable, like all the financials, everything I need. If somebody said, Hey, I'd like to take a look at buying your business. I could give them an, a link to a Dropbox folder in 30 seconds. It's like and your business they, is yeah, ready. It's ready. And, um, that's the that's the goal and everything that you know I'm acquiring and everything that you know my anybody on my team is looking at is once we own it we maintain that deal room as if it's ready to go and mm -hmm. it it if that mindset is huge and and it, I believe in what you were talking about earlier um this misconception that small businesses and service businesses are not sellable uh, I run into a lot. I'm not ready to buy, but that's because they haven't done their homework. So let's talk a little bit about that. What does it take if you you say say we've got listeners out there, you own you know a service company, a pest control, consulting, whatever it happens to be, and you are the center of it. You're the head sales guy. You're the accountant. What are the steps to get that to where you can retire out of it, sell it to somebody else? Okay, let me back up before I answer your question and okay. say the reason this question is important is most people who get ready to sell their business don't do it because they're ready to sell. They do it because they all of a sudden have to sell. Somebody is sick. They need financial. They, they, an opportunity has come up to make way better money somewhere else. They need to relocate. They hate their partner and all of a sudden they want out. And so the point is keep it ready for sale all the time. So what does a sale ready business look like? It has strong financial condition, clean legal condition. And there are checklists I have in the books of go through and rate your business one to five on each of these ratings. Is, are your finances strong? In other words, not only is our sales going up, but our cost of sales staying consistent. Because if cost of sales are soaring, then you're eating up your profit right there. What about operating expenses? Are they staying steady? And then profit. And the reason profit's so important is it is the baseline for pricing your business. And we'll get into that. But you need strong financial condition. You need strong legal condition. You need strong image and reputation. So I tell people... Go to Google or whatever and go to private browser so they don't know it's you and Google your business and look at what comes up. If what comes up is a bunch of bad reviews or nothing, you know you got some work to do. And branding for dummies goes into <laughs> what to do with that. Um, you need strong operations and organization. And that comes down to you can't be the only one. You need strong market and industry. So if the market you're in is really declining or the industry you're in is really declining, you need to start moving away from maybe uh, if all of a sudden you have an irrigation system in California saying you can't irrigate anymore, maybe you need to move into zero scaping. You know, you start to go where the market is leading you. You need competitive products. Are your products really competitive? Look at who you're up against and what are they charging? What are people willing to pay for them? If it's way more than you, then your products aren't competitive unless they are price competitive, which is rarely a premium position. You need a committed and growing clientele. And by that, I mean, as you said, not one to two customers and commitments. So if you can get contracts, if you can get re income that comes in every month, you know, that you know every month you've got $120 from coming in for from 100 landscaping clients. And you need transferability. And that means all the contracts have transferable clauses. Your employees have transferable contracts. Your lease is long lasting, that type thing. That's a saleable business. Yeah, I actually looked at a, uh, a company that had uh, a bunch of service contracts and everything and read through them. I couldn't find that in there, handed it over to an attorney friend of mine who was helping me out with this. I say helping him out. I paid him, uh, but <laughs> it, it wasn't free. Uh, but he, he's like, it doesn't have them and we'll have to do new contracts. So he had uh, 225 clients and I asked him, how often you interact with these clients? He goes pretty much twice a year. I, 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 I build them when I install uh, like new pumps and, you know, and new equipment. 
And then they just, they go on auto pay all year when I refill it. And at the end of the year, when I, when I, uh, winterize this it was an outdoor pest control system for my pest control company when they winterize it i i get a hold of a lot of them and tell them if i see anything or what what's next year so i was like you talk to these guys two times a year and you're thinking i need to go to, to all every single one of them and say we need a new contract you know so i had to structure a deal that he didn't accept it's basically based on how many people stayed right you know because <clears throat> then this gets down to structuring the deal and that is a very common thing you just did right. like a lot of times when you sell a business, it's called seller financing. If you offer seller financing, you're going to get more money for your business than if you don't. Now, this takes out the chance that you have such a great product that somebody wants to just, you know, this is the tech world. We're not talking tech. We're talking. But you're going to sell it for a down payment, and then you're going to sell it for and that down. First of all, you're going to price it by your assets and by your blue sky. And part of your blue sky is future earnings for five years. And you can put a ceiling and a floor on that. So you can say, because if they completely botch it, you as the previous seller should get your, your floor. And if they just soar beyond expectations, you as the seller shouldn't get that. So you have a ceiling and a floor for that future earnings. And usually it's a percentage of. So that's exactly what you are aiming to do. Right. I wanted to, you know, in my world, it's all about minimizing risk, right? Exactly. Um, I want to give everybody a fair deal, but I don't, I, I, I can't pay, you know, I think I only wanted 250 K for the whole business. I can't hand him that check on, you know, and plus it was two weeks before he winterized it. Right. So he wanted to check for, for the, the full amount. And then he wanted to winterize that. And I wouldn't talk to those customers until spring when we, when with everything stalls out and we activate them. And then I have to go get new contracts from every single one of them. Like oh, that's, just, that's, that's not how this is going to work. No, right? This is a not transferable business. Right. And guess what? It didn't most biz by sell will tell you anywhere from 60 to 90% of businesses that are for sale don't sell. So what do you think? What, what are the key factors in that? Cause I've heard that statistic a lot and I've asked almost every expert this, and we've got some different answers. What do you think are the key factors that keep 60 to what do you say? 90% of those businesses from selling. And the 90 does not come from biz by sell. It comes from other sources. Okay. They say they say 60 to 70, I think. Okay. But really, basically, and, and this m minimizes the importance of a business sale, but a lot of business buyers are looking to buy a job. They're looking for good income. And it used to be 100,000. And they now need in a lot of markets more than that. If your business, if they do the numbers and it doesn't deliver at least that, they're not going to buy your business unless it's a hobby. If you have a yarn shop and you're selling to somebody who just loves fiber arts, the money is less important. Shh, my wife's in the point, next room. We got to talk. No, no talking about yarn. She hears <laughs> that. She'll be in here trying to join in. <laughs> buying a hobby, a love, interaction with people who love what you love, that's different. You can, you can probably sell that, but you're not going to make much money. But you're not making much money now, so that's okay. Um, I just looked up Build, Biz Buy Sell before this, and they're showing the median revenue of the sales in late 2021 was the revenue from the business was 625 to 690 Okay. Uh, thousand. And the median sale price was $325,000. Now, backing up again to that 100,000, most people want to know. So let's say you can show that your business for its owner makes $100,000, which let's say 150, because I think that's what more people are looking for now. And in a minute, I'll tell you how to get to that number. The average business sells for two to four times average earnings, average owner earnings. It's called seller discretionary earnings. SDE, you'll see this a lot. So if you look at it, if the average business is selling for 325, you can kind of bet that it is, most of them go for two times, be honest. So it, it, it's making about $150,000 for its owner. That is not the bottom line on the income sheet. The income statement, the balance sheet, the income statement is showing legal taxable income. It takes out absolutely everything legally it can to get as low a tax impact as you can. When you're selling, you start with that number, but then you add back in 
everything that benefited the owner directly. So you add back in the owner's salary, the owner's car, if the owner gets a car stipend. And if the owner owns a car, you usually sell it beforehand because that's, or the owner buys it out and gives, anyway, um, anything that the owner got for their car, any memberships that the owner had that aren't essential to the business, but they were tax, uh, tax exemptions, you back out everything and that becomes what the owner takes from the business. And that's the number that you times from two to four. And in my books and, and on, uh, on the biz buy sell site, I have a little chart. You go through all the attributes that owners look at and you give them a scale of one to four, or one to five. And then you add up that the marks you gave them and that becomes what you hope will be your earnings multiple. Okay. So we, they know now the process and where to go look to, to see that. Uh, we talked a little bit about like uh, the small small to medium business. A lot of those guys on Biz by Sell are going to be in that category where they're owner operated, owner run. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk a little bit about like how does a business owner or how do you suggest a business owner make the shift to where you know they could take that first three week vacation and verify that the business still runs and still doing good. I always tell people that, you know, it's a two to three year process. Do your three week vacation, wait six months, go, go on a, you know, a, a five or six week vacation. And at the end of the second or third year, when you think it's totally re ready to, to sell, take the entire month of December off and, and come back and expect it to, your business to be doing better than it was when you, when you left. Right. And, uh, but how do you make that like that initial shift? You're in there every day. You're you're the sales guy. You're the CEO. You know you're a five or six person company, so you're a significant part of the labor. How do you start making the shift to uh, get ready to sell and have somebody else own and run that? Well, one thing you can do is look around your business and say, is there somebody who should be a partner in this business who is a likely successor to the business? And if you do that huge caveat, get a buy-sell agreement. Because people enter partnerships on a handshake, and that's not what you can do. You have to know. I mean, even Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt are having a fight over, did you see this over, they don't have a good, it's not an enforceable buy-sell agreement on their winery or something. I mean, get a buy-sell agreement. So when the partner wants to take over, or when one of you wants to leave, the other one knows exactly what it's going to cost. So first thing you do is look around your business. Can someone take over as a, become a partner and start sharing what's on your shoulders? The other thing I would say is get your finances into someone else's hands, even if it is a professional firm. Um, we hired a CFO. We hired a CFO probably five years before we, or maybe longer than that, before we sold the business. And that person handled the, the money. Two things happen then. All of a sudden, you have to do budgets. You have to do quarterly meetings to see if how you're doing. You start to run your business like a business. And it's a small business. So what we used to do is pay our accountant, our, our outside accountant and attorney, once a quarter to attend our board meetings. They held our feet to the fire. And you know they're the ones at one point said, you know what? You need a profit sharing plan. Okay, step toward becoming a real business that somebody wants to buy. Um, so I would say, number one, look around your business. Is there a partner? And you don't have to have a partner. It, in some ways, it complicates the sale process unless they're the buyer. Um, the other thing is look at a vice president. Who can you groom and really pay adequately as a vice president who you think will stay with the business even through a transition? Get the finances off your shoulders. Um, out of your head. That is the worst place to keep your books. Um, Somebody said to me once, it's hard to keep a million dollars in your head. Well, that was back then. Now, what are you keeping? Even a small business. Um, so, and and then start, how else to get, start getting clients to call someone else. I mean, we used to have account executives and we started calling them account supervisors and they had coordinators. We only had 30 people, but still the clients knew to call that person. And guess what? They got a quicker response. They got more hand-holding. That person could be over in their office in minutes, whereas as the owners, we couldn't. I mean, 
So you start really sharing responsibility and client contact, even at the risk that that person could leave. But if you have good systems, if that person leaves, all the the client data has been captured in your databases and you go on. Yep. So you're operating your business, you're looking around and you may or may not have an internal employee that fits the bill of this, you know, being able to run the show when you're gone. What about looking outside of the company or even, you know, in my space, uh, some of these smaller business, it, I, I was working with the business. I'm just going to bring this story into this. We're working with a business the other day and he actually introduced a new phrase. He, uh, we always say acquire to hire. He was wanting to do an acquire to retire. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, can you help me do an acquire to retire? And I said, what? He goes, I have a smaller business. It's one of my competitors. The guy runs EOS. He's like down. I mean, he runs his business better than I run mine. Key performance indicators like this guy had as a system and process. I want to acquire him and have him be the CEO of all of it. And I want to retire out. And I've already talked to him. Will you help with that? And that was a unique response is that he didn't have anybody inside they could run his business as well or better than he could. Mm-hmm. And then he identified somebody outside of the company that, wait a second, if we came together, it was more of a merger, right? It'd be more of a merger. If they merged with this guy, that guy, you know, probably run this thing better than I can. What about an, you know, what about that concept of bringing somebody from the outside, either as an employee or some type of strategic play to make sure that you're well run? <sighs> Well, I would get some legal help to make sure the contracts are clear because you're going to be sharing everything about your business. It's sort of like selling to a competitor. Um, They're going to see all your books and what if they don't buy. So um, that is certainly one way to go. And the truth is, if there's no one in your company who can help you build, grow and and build the reputation of your company, then you do need to hire someone, whether it's through a strategic partnership or biting the bullet and actually paying someone a top level price, which we did. I mean, we hired a vice president and it was probably one of the hardest hires because in the end he was really, he, he felt he was capable of running the business and we weren't really ready to turn it all together over yet. Um, But still it set up a structure that then was attractive to the buyer. He knew that once we once we sold the business, he could see that there was a hierarchy, that he could see where he would fit in and where the support would still be. There's no one answer to your question. I wish there was. Yeah, I was thinking on the top of that is, is like now if, in today's environment, there's fractional everything. You can get a fractional CFO. You can get a fractional, CE, fractional CEO, right, to come in or even CEO coaches. Uh, there are fractional chief marketing officers. Um, I've had a few people ask me if I'd be a fractional chief marketing officer. Um, you know, there's just a lot of different avenues to bring the talent in. Mm -hmm. I would say in my gut feeling on this and, uh, help me out if you you think differently is if you're looking at building this to sell it and you're prepping to sell, you, I would think you'd want somebody in there. That's not just fractional. You want somebody that can be there through the transaction. That's part of the package of selling, right? The team at least when I'm evaluating a company, the team is a critical part of it. Like Absolutely. who's staying, who's going, what skills do they have? How far can they take that? A lot of times I even kind of secretly look, is the owner holding these guys back? Could they actually do better without this guy? Right? Because a lot of times the owner's just done things a certain way for a long time and the team's ready to grow. And chances I- are, if you ask the team, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what size company do you think is buying fractional CEOs to fractional SFOs? I've seen... I would, I would say they're in the million dollar revenue mode. They're about ready to bring in somebody full time, but just not quite. Yeah. Uh, I had talked to a company, he's doing 3 million. So he has one I'm trying to think of the, the smallest one I've talked to, uh, $650,000, um, equipment installing company. They basically get contracts with, uh, high end audio and video sales companies and they install it and like set up your TV room and stuff. He's got a fractional chief marketing officer now. That's the smallest, but uh, he's almost ready to have somebody in full house, full time. That's all their job is, but uh, not quite. So I think there's that. I think they're a bridge, you know. But to the to a business buyer, that support system, that organizational support, 
is valuable. The question the buyer still is going to have is if that technical expert who's currently at the helm and who currently has the confidence of the clients and probably the licenses and everything else, um, is the buyer going to be capable of retaining it all when that person steps away? So it's, I think, a little more believable when you actually have a second in somebody who mirrors a lot of you versus fills in for what you don't have. Um, and that was my gut. I was wondering where you would go with that. My gut is it almost needs to be in house and they need to fill out a lot of the shoes that you're walking away from. Right? right. They need to be at least capable of it. Maybe not actively doing it, but they're fully capable of feeling like when you take that three week vacation, who steps up and do, does and makes the decisions you would have made while you're, while, right. if you were because there. The clients or customers aren't buying marketing or, or financial management from you. They are buying your product or service. So the question is, does the buyer feel that the product or service that the clients have confidence in will continue with you gone? And if the answer is yes, and the financials are all strong, you've got a very saleable business. And that's what the first chapter of the Biz Buy Sell Guide really goes through is how to get your business in sale ready shape. And you really want to do it for two reasons. One is to sell, but the bigger reason in the interim is that when you have a sale ready business, it's easier to own and easier to sell. And you don't know when you're going to sell it. You don't know when something could happen and you need to sell and is it ready? But if it's sale ready, and I, I always liken it to detailing a car, you're going to sell your car. You go get it detailed because you want to get the best money you can and you pick it up from the detail and you drive away and you look around this car and you go, why are we selling this car? It looks pretty good. Well, that's the same with a detailed business. Think of it as detailing your business. You're cleaning it up. You're cleaning up its first impression. You're cleaning up its web presence. You're cleaning up its finances and legal obligations. You're cleaning up its staffing security. So you're making sure people have, con, you know, the, and, you're, and you're heightening business morale. You're strengthening your brand. And, and your brand isn't how your finances are managed. Your, fi your brand is that your finances are invisible to clients. That all they're seeing is these preferential, these premium products that they buy from you or services. You know, it's interesting is... Um... I have a case where I talked to a business when I first started looking at this before I took any mentoring and, you know, about the time I was buying the, uh, the equipment and, and setting up my pest control company and buying that, which I bought totally wrong. That's why I went and got mentoring. Uh, I bought it way too small. And uh, anyway, um, I was, I, I talked to a guy who, uh, who had a business and I was like, look, he, I couldn't get him where he wanted to be. And I say, here's the steps you need to get, get to. And it was all the stuff you're talking about. I think I even was using your guide because I've had that for a while now. And I just walked him through like, here's this, here's where to get it. I emailed him the PDF or whatever and told him how to get it. And, and uh, I contacted him about four or five weeks ago and said, how's it going? He said, it's going great. I love my business. I'm not going to sell it now. <laughs> you know, what? there you go. That's a detailed car. Yeah, that's why when you said that, I was like, yeah, you know, it, it, I was like, I uh, I talked myself out of a good deal. Like, no, you didn't, because you didn't want it the way he had it. Yeah. You would want it the way he has it now, but he's just not ready. And he's 68, so five or six years from now, he's probably going to call me again, right? Yeah, you know, when he, he, when he, when he is ready. And his business will be saleable. I'm going to give a pitch for Biz by Sell right now. This okay, is go for the, guide, it. the guide to selling your small business. And I wrote it, but Biz by Sell not only produced it, they make it available for free. And all you have to do is go to their site, click on, and once you get there, you either click that you're a buyer or a seller, click on sell, scroll down, click this, and you can download it for free. You have to enter your email address, but I guarantee you they don't start badgering you with emails or anything. They just want to get the information to you. And, uh, I'll put the link in the show notes if you want. That's cool. So I'll just yeah. put a link directly to that page. And uh, I would love it if you would. And I and okay. I asked Biz Buy Sell before our talk. Or do do they welcome? You know, absolutely. They said okay. this guide. So many people have downloaded. It. We're actually talking about expanding it. Um, so 
it is a really good resource, which backs me up a bit to something, how much I know for a fact people don't get their businesses ready for sale. When I wrote Selling Your Business for Dummies, which is this book, and I'll tell you right now, it's out of print. And the reason it's out of print, of all my books, it was my lowest selling book. And it's shocking. That's so shocking. I I thought it was just going to go off the market. But here's the thing I learned. People don't think about selling their business until they're ready to sell their business. And they're only going to sell it once, so they don't think they need a book that they're going to refer to repeatedly. And they don't want to work that hard. And that's why once they're ready to sell, they go to the Biz Buy Sell site. They download the book. And do you know, most people who go to the site don't list their businesses. They know they're not ready. They list them maybe maybe later, but not immediately. Um, so I, I just know for a fact, people don't think about selling in time. And that's what you're doing. And I'm so grateful to what you're doing, to helping more people realize, let's get it ready now for us, for us on two counts, make it better to own and, and run, make it easier to sell when the time's right. So what do you think that, when, when should a business owner start thinking about that? You know, I, I'm of the mindset from the day you own it, but absolutely, you know, <laughs> you're running a business like, you know, when's, when's the best, best time to, what do they say? Uh, when's the best time to plant a, a, an olive tree a hundred years ago? When's the second best time right now? Right. Um, the, the same thing here is like, when was the best time to like, think about selling your business when you form a, formatted it and grew it to where it's at now? You know, that was the best time, but the next best time is now, right? Mm-hmm. What is the timeline from uh, deciding, okay, I want to run this business as if it's for sale, even if I don't want to sell it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do something with it one of these days. What is the timeline do you think for most of these? And this, and this is genre we're talking about the, the, you know, let's say less than 25, 30 employees, less than five or 10 million. They're, they're, they're a key operator in their company. Mm-hmm. What's what's that shift take? You know, that- I think it takes I tell people it takes up to 18 months to get your business ready for sale. And that's everything from going through th- little things like making sure who owns your domain name. If I own it personally, it's not an asset of the business that needs to change. If I had the website produced by somebody who owns basically I have to call them to update it. That's not an asset of the business. All these things have to change. The contracts, you start writing different kinds of contracts with your clients that include transferable clauses. You uh, you start getting key person uh, contracts on employees. It takes up to 18 months, maybe a very simple business, less time, but still. And then, and then cleaning up your finances and making sure that your operating costs, you go through your operating costs or your cost of sales, I'm sorry, and say, well, what are we paying? A big chunk of our cost of sales is going for, in your case, maybe internet, streaming services or whatever. You go, we could get more competitive there and bring that that variance down and therefore gross profit up. And then you do the same with operating costs. And you're not saying that you're trying to you know, pare your business down to nothing. You're trying to get out any extraneous costs to get that bottom line strong and going up. And if it's not going up now, it might take more than 18 months. It's interesting. There's a lot of parallels to the real estate world. And the real estate world, if you're running and owning a business, you know, it, it trips the owners up a lot of times because for the last three or four years, they've been trying to minimize taxes, minimize taxes, maximize like what they keep in the company. And all of a sudden, they try to uh, get qualified to, to buy a house, and they're shocked that they don't qualify for much of a house because they don't show much profit. I think a lot of the same thing is you're thinking about selling your business. You kind of got to go, you got to pick a middle ground from what's a happy, like tax, reducing your taxes as much as possible, and a happy showing as much profitability and, you know, and, and really that seller's discretionary earnings as possible. Well, but to add one thing that's a little bit mitigating and comforting is that seller's discretionary earnings do add back in one-time extraneous costs. So if one year you did all new cabinetry in the business, of course, that would be a a depreciating. but, But still, if you had a big expense one year, you just you just qualify that, and p- and people understand. Um, in fact, good buyers are impressed that you put that in right. and then took it out of the the earnings picture. 
Yeah, it's important too because if you don't, and if, if if I look at your business and it's something there's renewable things you need, it's like see you. I was looking at a printing company. They owned a printing shop and did uh, swag. Like right? they printed on everything, and <laughs> their equipment um, was I want to say fifteen. Like the newest piece of equipment they had in there was ten to fifteen years old. Now they maintained it well. It's all running. They said every piece of equipment in here works. But the only thing that I caught in, in my mind is like fifteen years ago when you bought that, how much did you spend on equipment? And they had four or five million dollars worth of equipment on their floor, right? And I'm thinking at some point that stuff's got to be replaced and probably Absolutely. sooner than later since you're running on, you know, I say that there were newer pieces they bought. It, it was grown organically so that a lot of that equipment was bought over time. Yeah, but, through the depreciation cycle already. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's there was like, I was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, so that was kind of a red flag is like there hadn't been a refresh in equipment in a very long time. And uh a lot of the, unless it was something needed to print a new line, like the, that's just a new technology come out. Like they had 3D printers to do some stuff. But uh, if it wasn't new technology, they were still operating on, like they were good at fixing everything they'd ever bought. I think every piece of equipment that company ever bought was still up and running. And, and that was impressive. Yeah, yeah, that was impressive. And it's the same right. It's kind of like, you know, if I lose their maintenance guy, do I have to replace five and a half million dollars worth of equipment? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you you mentioned the word red flags, and in the Biz Buy Sell guide, we have a page of the red flags. Yeah. Low earnings, high competition, low advantage, no key staff, weak operations, low name recognition, dependency on just a few clients, processes that aren't systemized or easy to take over, declining industry or market area, expiring or problematic lease, aged equipment, and facilities and legal, financial, operational, or transition problems. So those are them. I mean, if it, it takes 18 months to fix that and maybe more. But the other thing is, if you're going to lease new equipment, get transferable leases because you know you are thinking about selling the business. So you created a marketing agency, took it to maturity, and sold it. What do you and, you and since then you've done a lot of research for all these books, right? So you learned stuff since the last business you've sold. What do you know now that you wish you'd have known before you listed that business for sale? Like, what's the like, man, if I'd have just known this before we could engage in that process, it would have been different. Well, I'm going to be honest and say we were very fortunate. There's little I would change about the business. But since then, as I did the books and really started to have a career after the, the business. And it wasn't as much to make money as to get information out, but I knew I had to get paid and I wanted to be free information. Like even my website is almost all, you can click to buy the books, but there's tons of free information. How am I going to get paid? And then I learned when you can hitch to the strongest horse. And so I knew at the time dummies was strong. So four dummies. So I, I contacted, and that was my first thing. Then after that, Biz by Cell actually contacted me, but then Microsoft called. Would I write their um, biz, small business training courses and, uh, and small business? It was called Business on Main was the site. So I just hitched to the strongest horse. And I think businesses could do that as well. You do that by getting a few strong clients. I mean, we got the state of Oregon to do its tourism. And after that, guess what comes in? All kinds of tourism clients because you're kind of in the shadow. I read a book years ago called Horse Sense, and it was about this, hitched to the strongest horse. And so I think sometimes businesses try too hard to go it alone. You say, who can we hitch up with that gives us more credibility, builds our brand credibility, well, I agree with that 100%. And, you know, a client list is a very attractive, like who's on your client list yeah. is very attractive to the buyer, especially some of the higher paying client uh, buyers. What, what we refer to in the industry as strategic purchases. Absolutely. A lot of times the strategic pur uh, uh, you know, purchase happens because you have certain clients, you know, especially in like in your marketing agency world. Your client list is critical because maybe the, the acquiring strategic buyer has some products and services that you don't offer. They'd love to upsell that, but they just can't get in the door. You're in the door of these clients. That, that's this, a mm -hmm. huge advantage. So uh, 
you know, be proud of your customer list and go after, go after that. The, you know, I love your the str- hitch to the strongest horse. Get some of those on your client list because it, it's appealing to the buyer to know that, you know, you know, you've got those clients, you've got that, you know, that In strong. Some ways, it, it comes back to branding. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't my branding, but, but it comes back to branding because you're trying to sell your brand when they're studying your brand, they look at your clients and see brand names. Mm -hmm. This is very affirming and, and brands happen to attract brands. So do look at who you are doing business with. If you're doing business with, you know, the second half of the top 10 list, how can you get some of the top, the first half of the top 10 list, make a couple of stretch goals. Um, And, and build a business that has high attraction. And really, in many ways, Branding for Dummies walks, walks you through. What does it take to build? In some ways, a brand is a reputation. And how do you up your reputation because it makes your business more saleable? The man that bought our business, he he was a Catholic. And so he went to the Catholic Church and asked the priest if he'd ever heard of us. I mean, people want to know that, you know, and now, of course, it's all online. They do online searches. But you make sure that whoever they might be going to to ask knows about you and has something good to say. I love that. I love that. Uh, you know, it's the story that other people tell about you, right? It's the yeah. it's not the story you're trying to say. You, could, you, you put a story out there, but that just influences the branding, right? What really is the brand and what really matters to like a, an acquirer or like myself or somebody, you know, private equity or strategic purchase is when they start talking to people in the, in the space, what do they say about you? I, I turned away a deal the other you know, like, like three, four weeks ago now, five, six weeks ago now. I know people in, in, in the guy's industry. So I called them up and said, what do you know about this little company in Colorado? And they were like, he's in a bad space. He's, he's, he's crashing and burning. He's in, you know, you look go. at it. You know, I didn't even, I hadn't done, started my due diligence yet. And they're like, you got to look at his DNB report. He's actually, I forgot what it's called, but he has top vendors not sourcing him anymore because he hasn't paid their, you know, their bills and stuff. And uh, this is just like, I went out to the industry because I've, I've got a huge network and like I talk to people in the industry. What do you know about this little company over here? And I don't say they're for sale. I don't disclose any of that stuff. I just kind of want to know, Absolutely. you know, what do you know about, you know, the industry? I start with the industry and then I kind of get into what do you know about, you know, these particular players in the industry. And, uh, it matters. It really absolutely matters. This is what you do over the 18 months. You say, where's everywhere they might check. In the beginning, I told you, I would tell you something funny about our Wall Street Journal ad. Pub set ad. My husband did, wrote it. He's really good. And so he wrote the pub set ad. Small agency in attractive community, upside potential, right? WSJ, whatever. Because you don't reveal your name, especially in a service business, because it scares clients to death. And so Wall Street Journal made a typo. We're so excited. We see our ad and it says in highly unattractive location. <laughs> so he called them and they said, Oh my God, that's our effort. Yeah, it's our, our error. It was a pub set ad. We'll run it again. Well, that's all we cared because it was free. We got it run two times. The unattractive location ad brought more results than the attractive location. What did people think? It must be quite a deal if it's, you know, all that in an unattractive location. So the point is people want to know what makes this place special and they're going to check into it. We did sell it to someone. I think he did re, re, uh, respond to the unattractive. Anyway, so just so you know, it's pretty interesting that uh, what causes people to have interest and what they need to know to look further. Well, Barbara, we're getting close to the top of the hour now and uh, just kind of want to make sure people know how to get a hold of you. Uh, we have your website up. If you're watching the video version of this, it's on the screen. It's bizbizstrong.com, B-I-Z-S-T-R-O-N-G.com. She has a lot of free resources, a lot of uh, you know stuff on there, links to her books that she's authored. And it's a great place to start if you're thinking about buying a business because, you know, I would say go and look at that, you know, the guide to selling a business and use those checklists to make sure you're verifying those things are strong if you're going to buy on, on the buying side. So it plays for both sides. And uh, I, is there anything that, like, that you really want people to know? Like the, what is the biggest takeaway or a couple takeaways from our conversation today that you really want to land with small business owners? 
Well, I would say both you and I love small businesses and we want them to succeed and succeed means capturing the final round of revenue. So I want them to be in position to sell their business and I don't want them to wait until they're ready to sell because I think that's too late. And if you go to my website, right from the homepage, you can download the first chapter of several of the books, or if not that, the cheat sheet to the books. And there is the link to the Biz Buy Sell guide, although I appreciate if you share it as well. Um, there's also, if you click free resources, a lot of the columns I've written for Microsoft and American Express that are on, they're on Fox News, they're on all over the place, and you can just click and read all of those. Um, mostly run a business that's ready for sale and, and you'll like running your business more. You might even want to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> the detailed car, right? Yeah. I, I thank, thank you for your time. It's been lovely. Hang on for a few minutes after we end the show and uh, you and I can chat for a few more seconds. But I do appreciate it. It's been great. I, I know the, the listeners are going to love it. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed the time with you. Thank you. Awesome. Good luck to everyone. And that's the show. The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind. The Investors and Entrepreneurial Professional Mastermind combines the traditional peer-to-peer -peer mastermind introduced first in Napoleon Hill's famous book, Think and Grow Rich, with accountability partnering where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to TIEPM.com. That's T I E. PM.com and check out the Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind.